Hello, RightsCon, and welcome to the second day at 9 o'clock. Um, so I'm the first lightning talk speaker. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm not speaking at exactly a lightning pace here. Um, I was going to do a presentation um, using my outdoor activist voice, um, but then I realized that we would be speaking at 9 o'clock in the morning, and at 9 o'clock in the morning, no one wants to hear that kind of high energy least of all me. Uh, I'm not sure I can even muster that amount of energy at 9 o'clock in the morning. We have six uh, incredible speakers for you, um, and I am one of them. Um, so I, I'm actually, I, I, one of the reasons I'm going to be relatively downbeat in this, this first talk is, is because it, um, I'm discussing a, a, a relatively downbeat topic. Um, could we have the, um, the website up, please? So. Um, uh, in October um, of last year, I, uh, I, I started, I, I, my name's Stanley O'Brien, I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and I um, did a small site here called Offline, um, which was to draw attention to the increasing number of technologists who were being uh, targeted with detention and imprisonment uh, around the world. Uh, and this, this, this actually comes from, uh, uh, partly from my experience uh, working for the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, there's been a long tradition that we're, we're not necessarily all aware of, of uh, um, uh, uh, creating movements around individuals, journalists, writers, um, uh, when they're imprisoned to restore some of their integrity and to uh, widen um, awareness of their situation to a broader audience. And my concern when I rejoined EFF was that um, in the same way as journalists and writers are targeted because of their disproportionate effect in protecting human rights and exercising human rights and freedom of expression and association, that the same thing was going to happen to technologists. The technologists were going to be specifically targeted because if you take out technologists, you can um, diminish the magnifying effect that they can have on uh, uh, dissent and reform. Um, as I worked on offline, and if we could scroll it down a little bit, if that's okay, um, uh, I, 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 was, I, I went through some of the people that, that, that we, we, we knew who were being detained um, from their works in technology, Allah, Bazel, uh, Eskinder Niger, Saeed Malakpour. And, and as I was editing um, their pieces to present to the world, um, hopefully a wider world than just the circle of people who knows these as, as friends and colleagues, um, I, I, I realized that I was editing their stories in a particularly interesting way. When you, when, you, when you write about individual targets in this way, you end up turning them into heroes. You end up editing um, the, the gray areas, and, and the story becomes much more black and white. Um, and this is understandable for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, one of the reasons why people are detained and targeted in this way is to defame them, is to separate them from the rest of society. And one of the ways you do that is you pick on you know, tiny flaws or, or, or imaginary conspiracies, and you, you, you throw as much mud as you can and, uh, and hope that it sticks. And, and tarring them with a prison sentence is one of the most effective ways of doing that. Um, but it felt strange to, to, to elide the shades of gray. It felt, it felt strange to me to be writing these stories, and these people aren't sinners, but they're not saints either. And one of the reasons why that happens as well is, is distance, frankly. The further you are away from a political situation, the easier it is to be Manichaean. Is Manichaean? I never know. Um, uh, to make it black and white. And so we're sort of familiar of that with, with people outside of our community, right? When we talk about journalists, when I wrote about journalists at the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, to protect journalists it, you know, you saw them as heroes um, uh, in a country not your own. Whereas in that country, of course, journalists are as controversial as they are in, in, in your own country. You know, no one, no one has absolute respect for a journalist, particularly if they're presenting an opposite political view. So it's a distance thing that turns things into black and white. And I realize that this is going to be a, a, a growing problem because I think that the, the, the maudlin bet that I've made by launching offline is that we're going to see more people. Um, in this list, the, ta the technology is going to be increasingly targeted, and people in our community are going to find themselves arrested and detained. And because they're close to us, because they're, they're our friends, uh, we have loyalty to them, but we also see these shades of gray. And that shades of gray can be 
debilitating. Um, uh, many people saw, saw, saw Aaron Swartz as a hero um, after, after his, his, his passing away, but many of us also remembered when he was arrested and how ambiguous and, and, and diminished the response was um, in those early days. If you actually go through the Internet Archive and look at people's responses, the moment a charge was made, there was a distancing effect and people people walked away from a person who, who was at that particular moment most vulnerable. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a Facebook vice president was, was arrested um, in Brazil, and I had this interesting moment of going, well, well what prism do we look through at uh, a, a president of a, a, of a corporation who is arrested in, in that situation for protecting the privacy of, of their users. I, and I think that viewpoint looks very different if you're in Brazil than if you're looking from outside Brazil. We know all these names, but, but, but um, I mean, does anyone know the name of the, the, the Facebook vice president? I, I do, but I looked it up. It's Diego de Zedan, and he was detained for a day. How do we write about that? I don't have any good answers to this, um, and it's very early in the morning, so I don't expect any of you to have good answers to this. This is something that communities have struggled with, political communities have been struggled with for, for, for the beginning of time, uh, loyalty and solidarity versus the truth. But I do have like a couple of thoughts, one thought perhaps that I'll leave you with, which is the more I think about this and the more I think about how people are tarred by this brush when they're arrested and they're detained and they're thrown into prison, the more I be it begins to feel like it's a problem with our understanding of justice. And as uh, from my, 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 my sort of privileged position at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, one of the things that we get to spot is how the issues of digital rights are constantly expanding into a wider world as the world itself becomes more influenced by, by digital issues. And one of the things I notice is more and more technologists are becoming interested in issues of justice, it's in, interested in issues of prison reform in the United States. And I think maybe the thing that, that I'll leave you with is that if we really want to both have the benefits of seeing things in a black and white way and the benefits of seeing things as they really are in shades of gray, we have to understand that, that, that we can't just discard and throw people away uh, when they enter into the justice system and the prison system or the, the, the court system. Because that's, that's the, the method of dictators. That's, that's the trick that they use to tar good people um, with an unfair brush. Thank you. When I was 16, my mom, my sister, and I visited my aunt in the city of Kerman. That's my mom's hometown in southern Iran. One hot afternoon, we were strolling the streets when I noticed that my headscarf was on backwards. So I quickly picked it up and turned it around and continued. We entered a fabric store. And as we entered, the door opened up again. So I turned around and my heart sank. There there were two men in uniform with mean piercing eyes staring right at me. I knew there were the moral police and they were there for me. The men approached me and said because my hair had shown, they were gonna arrest me. Mom refused to let me be taken alone, so they piled all of us into a van and took us in. The best that I could come up with was to pretend that I was religious. So I asked for a notepad and a pen and jotted down everything they were saying as fast as I could, like a really good student. I was held for five hours and only released after repenting and writing. Next time they warned, I would receive 50 lashes. This is life in Iran. By the government's own account, in 2013 alone, three million Iranians were arrested, were stopped by the Moro police for walking a poodle, for being out with a boyfriend, 
for playing music loudly or showing their hair. 90% of them, women. We are here at RightsCon because we believe in the rights of all citizens. We know technology plays a pivotal role in enhancing and protecting those rights. So, how would technology protect Iranians from the moral police? Guess what? There's an app for that. The same navigation applications we use to get to locations faster is allowing Iranians detour the moral police and avoid harassment and arrest. The app is called Gershad. It's Gershad is a contraction of the words Gashta Ershad, the Persian words for the moral police. Gershad's an app similar to Waze and Features. It's crowdsourced and users can view and report to each other the location of the moral police checkpoints in real time. Gershad was an instant hit. 30,000 downloads within days. 1,100 reviews hovering around five stars. Hundreds of media stories in at least eight languages that I could count. To me, its biggest indication of success probably came from my teenage stepson, Gabe. He's an American teenager, rarely leaves his room or he's four screens. The day after Gershot's release, when I walked in from work, he ran into the kitchen. Guess what? There's this cool Iranian app that's trending on Reddit. It already has 4,000 upvotes. Twitter in Iran lit up as well. Perfect example of civil disobedience, said one tweet. Each download is a protest of our rights being trampled upon, said another. Technology knows no physical boundaries and has ripple effects. Saudi woman tweeted that their moral police is killing them. Gershai 2.0 will include Arabic, was tweeted back. Why is Gershai a hit? Why is civic technology critical? First, the infrastructure exists. There are 70 million Iranians in Iran. More than half of them have smartphones. A million new smartphones are being added every month. Every month, the country is quickly moving to 4G. Secondly, Iranians are ready for change. They're young, they're techy, they're global. 70% of the country is under the age of 35. This young population is being ruled by few old fanatics. These old men, their inner circle, and followers make up about 10% of the country, yet they own and control all the schools, all the media, all the institutions. I believe in technology. I believe in its impact. I see its potential. Technology will provide the other 90% with a platform, a secure platform, to organize, assemble, and express themselves. Technology is our best bet at taking our country back. With all this potential, need, and desire, Gershad was the first app of its kind to be released in Iran, first do-good app that we know of. Until today, right here with you, we are launching publicly for the first time our latest project, Iran Cubator. Get it, Iran Incubator? I founded United for Iran in 2009 to help protect civil liberties in Iran. We support civil society and civic engagement through technology. Iran Incubator, United for Iran's latest project, will pair up dev developers and organizers to make a dozen or so apps, similar to Gershot, for use within Iran. Over the next 18 months, teams chosen will receive operational, technical, and financial support. Freedom of expression, freedom of religion, gender equality, all of these are being supported by Gershad. 
the dozens of other rights and social issues that at best are being ignored and at worst being caused by the Islamic Republic. Iran Kibater will support these rights and issues. We're in conversation with dozens of communities for months now to find out what their unique challenges and potential solutions are. We will work with and not for these communities. We will prioritize security, inclusion, and accessibility. Here are a few examples of the apps that we're starting with. One app will support the victims of domestic violence by connecting them with each other and resources. Another app is similar to Yelp and focuses on government transparency and accountability. Users will rate and review government officials and offices. Other apps that we're considering will focus on the environment, LGBTQI rights, and working children. As we pave the road of civic technology, I hope for global impact. The same way Gershad will be used by Saudi women, I envision Iran Kibater apps will be used, will inspire and support and protect citizens regionally and globally. Iran Kibater will enable those in Iran to deepen and broaden their community. I'm here with you today to build our community in support to them. We need support to spread the word, to get media, to build our partnerships, and specifically to recruit affordable app developers. I was lucky that I was held for five hours. There are hundreds of Iranians in prison right now for lifetimes, years or lifetimes, for simply exercising their basic rights. Working for Free Iran is important work. It's rewarding and important work. It's my life's work. It's also challenging work, and it takes all of us. Though not easy, I have no doubt that our day will come, and likely in my lifetime. I look forward to the day that Iranian women can wear anything they damn please, that all our rights are honored. I look forward to the day that all Iranians regardless of background or belief, are free. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ben Rosewell. Um, I am actually a Canadian diplomat, uh, but I'm not here to talk to you about diplomacy today. In fact, nothing that I'm going to say reflects the views of the Canadian government whatsoever. So now that I've got that disclaimer out of the way. Um, but it does occur to me that those of you that are in this room that are part of this effort by Access Now uh, to protect and promote access to the internet do have something in common with diplomats. Um, those involved in civic participation and civic action uh, are often um, often say that they're trying to change the world. It's a, an expression you hear an awful lot here in Silicon Valley, and that also happens to be the motivation of many people, including myself, who joined the diplomatic service. Back in the 90s, pre-internet, that seemed like the way to do it. There's other ways to do it now, but it, there is kind of a common objective. Now, when you're talking about changing the world, you often get accused of naive uh, idealism. We are all Dorothy on the yellow brick road, unaware of the dangers of Oz. But you know that you are making a difference. In the last five to 10 years, citizens have been involved directly in shaping outcomes in global affairs to an extent never seen before. It's something that we notice, it's palpable from within the world of diplomacy, how citizens are organizing and having an impact directly, uh, often powered by technology. How many of you are members, for example, of Avaz? I'm one. There's 43 million of us that are members of, of Oz that signed petitions to change outcomes in global affairs. Change.org, anyone? 
143 million now are members of change.org. Then there's organizations like 350.org, which focuses on environmental issues. It's present in 188 countries in the world. Our own government only has embassies in 140 countries in the world. When these organizations bound, uh, bound together and uh, adopt a common goal, as they did with the climate talks, uh, the climate marches of 2014 and 2015, they can demonstrate the domestic pressure that changes government's views, and that in the case of the Paris Agreement in December of 2015, led to an accord that was more ambitious than anything that Kyoto ever accomplished. Thank you, Internet. Now, that is a bit of an exception to the rule, however, because there were 195 countries at Paris, and I can tell you it's extremely rare that you get 195 countries that agree on anything significant at all. More often in global affairs, global leaders, who we picture as these very powerful figures, have very little power to affect outcomes in global affairs. National governments have a lot of power within their, within, their, uh, within their borders, there's no doubt about that at all, but once you get past the national borders, even a country as powerful as the United States has very limited ability to affect what happens outside of its own borders. It's difficult to get 195 countries to agree, and I think often that activists feel that if uh, governments just saw things the right way or had their heart in the right place or had more knowledge or better knowledge that they would be able to affect change. I can tell you, having worked for 23 years in diplomacy, it's very, I, I do think that national governments actually have pretty good knowledge and pretty good idea of what, uh, what needs to be done, and often we do have our hearts in the right place, but it is just extremely difficult for governments to affect change. And that does point to a bit of a, a potential naivete in the petition model, because when you're petitioning, you're asking someone else to take action on your behalf. You're not taking action yourselves apart from signing the petition. And that's fine if the organization that you're asking to take action has the power to do so. But often what you find in global affairs is that global leaders end up looking like this guy, the Wizard of Oz himself, who as we know, when you pulled apart the, uh, the curtains, saw that it was a, a man who wasn't really controlling anything at all. In global affairs, the scale of the issues we're dealing with are so important that we can't leave it to just national governments. Citizens themselves need to band together to take direct action. In uh, what Mitchell from the Mozilla Foundation yesterday morning said uh, is distributed action. The, the most powerful method of human collaboration that we've seen that the internet has made possible in many different domains of human life mean, needs to be harnessed for global affairs. Now that leads me to another accusation that we often get um, when we're trying to change the world through online organizing and that's uh, that we get accused of clicktivism. This is a famous book written by Evgeny Morozov two or three years ago um, in which he indicated that a lot of the online organizing that takes place is extremely short term. Um, it's a petition that might just last for a few weeks or even dramatic changes in the, in the Arab world where, where um, revolutionaries came together to change their governments but a, a year later those movements barely existed whatsoever. There's a kind of short, ter short termism in civic organizing. Um, and often, uh, some of the causes that we see on petition sites tend to be relatively superficial in their, in their reach and in their impact. How many of you have been asked to sign petitions to save bees? I have nothing against saving bees, but the reason that they're so popular on all these petition sites is that they have this wide appeal that no one could put in action that is powered by social algorithms. So the reason that a company like Facebook is actually quite successful in motivating users to undertake uh, actions over and over and over again and to undertake more significant actions is because they study the patterns of users' behavior online to identify what are the algorithms that match the motivations of users to attract. Companies have the resources uh, to do that, to hire people, to, to hire data scientists, to look through those patterns. Generally, civic organizations do not. But if they were to bound, band together with sharing aggregate data about the patterns of citizens' engagement in global affairs issues, we believe that you could power a civic organization on the basis of social algorithms. Now, in the area of global affairs, there's also very controversial issues in sometimes taking on the interests of very powerful people uh, that have the means to disrupt and to punish those that are taking uh, action as well, and so there needs to be a very strong basis of security. So Perennial aims to build a distributed model for civic engagement in global affairs, powered by social algorithms, 
and protected through a blockchain. A blockchain is an architecture which allows you to separate the key pieces of information. Um, anything that's driven on social algorithms is going to have personal data that needs to be kept totally separate from information on actions being undertaken by, by uh, people on the site and from the organizations that are asking citizens to take action into three completely separate compartments so that even if the organization running the software is hacked, that, will, that organization will not be able to divulge information because they won't have it. It'll be protected through the blockchain. So that's what Perennial is going to try to do, build a distributed model for citizen engagement powered by social algorithms protected by the blockchain. We're going to launch it in the coming months in one of the issues that has become the most difficult intractable problem, one of the most difficult intractable problems in global affairs, which is the conflict in Syria. This is a conflict which has generated uh, 250,000 deaths, the worst migration crisis of modern times. Uh, the rise of ISIS is directly attributable to the violence in Syria um, and untold suffering inside the country as well. It's a, a problem that has escaped the ability of any national government to try and bring some end to the violence. Now, Citizens Uniting are not going to bring an end to the violence. We need to be quite clear about that. But one of the things that's been fascinating about Syria is that it served as a laboratory for, move, for civic movements, civic organizations to try and deliver some kind of assistance to people inside the country through the digital connectivity that somehow miraculously remains inside Syria. What Perennial is going to do is build a coalition of the organizations that are inviting citizens, global citizens interested in Syria um, through a series of micro-tasks to lend support to those that are trapped inside the conflict and share the information that comes, the, the aggregate data that comes so that we can learn social algorithms of what motivates citizens to take action. I'll give you three examples. The Syrian American Medical Society provides medical assistance to people inside Syria through telemedicine. So Syrian medical pr practitioners, nurses and doctors who are attending to the wounded or the, uh, the ill inside Syria, um, when they have access to the internet, can actually co communicate with medical professionals in the United States and elsewhere through video conferences to find out how to treat certain conditions. As we expand the circle of the medical practitioners outside Syria to provide assistance inside, um, it gives an opportunity for people outside Syria to, to do something concrete that has an impact in the lives of people inside the country. A second example, the Karam Foundation provides educational um, training to uh, Syrian youth. So Syria risks having an entire generation that, that is not educated because the educational system has been disrupted by the war, and this is the kind of dynamic that tends to turn conflicts into generational conflicts. Like we've seen in Afghanistan from the 60s to the 80s, there were very few Afghans that were in school because of violence, and as a result, the Taliban were created and it, created, it extended the, the conflict for another generation. The Karam Foundation is one of many that are trying to disrupt that pattern by providing education to those that are on the ground in Syria, and they also offer opportunities for people outside Syria to help. If you are able to teach English or other languages that they're trying to learn, or if you have other other skills that you can teach to Syrians through the internet, you can actually provide the, those, uh, that education to Syrians. And even when it comes to the source of the, of the violence itself, the Dutch government is putting together a network that is mapping out all of the companies and organizations that are involved in uh, importing the materials that make barrel bombs inside Syria. Barrel bombs being a, a, a weapon that has virtually no meta, uh, military use whatsoever, it's really only used to kill civilians. So the Dutch government is trying to map out how the various components of barrel bombs are getting into the country. Once that's identified, then it's possible for citizens around the world to name and shame the various companies that are involved in that trade and so, and, and so try and limit some of the violence to which people trapped inside Syria are subjected. So in conclusion, Perennial is building a distributed model to help citizens engage directly in global affairs powered by social algorithms and protected through the blockchain. We hope that you will join us if you have skills that you can lend, whether they're language skills or coding skills, whether you're involved in Syria organizations or know an organization that might want to partner with us, or if you're interested in becoming part of this distributed model of citizen engagement, please sign up at the website here or send us an email, and we'd love to work with you. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning.
My name is Fernando Berdion. I'm a researcher at Harvard, and I'm here today to talk about a very simple idea, and that's the idea of online rights and online duty. Um, so this is a big topic, of course. We're just going to uh, begin to touch on it today. But I want to begin um, here. I want to begin with this man, with H.G. Wells, who, as many of you know, was, apart from being a noted science fiction author and a futurist, one of the earliest and most vocal proponents of human rights. The idea that everyone, everywhere, should be entitled to basic protections and freedoms. Now, around 1940, this man wrote a letter to this man, Mohandas K. Gandhi, in India, asking him for advice, pinging him for feedback, we might say today. So, uh, in refining his idea, uh, his model of universal human rights, H.G. Wells asked Gandhi to, uh, to give, give his perspective as an anti-colonialist. And Gandhi's response is illustrative in a couple ways. Gandhi responds with this. Instead of focusing exclusively on rights, Wells should instead begin with the charter of the duties of man. And I promise that the rights will follow as spring follows winter. Now, apart from being a sort of quirky historical anecdote, um, I think this, this exchange is illustrative in a couple ways. It shows us, first of all, a, a very basic fact, which is that the language of human rights is not the only language available to us to talk about issues of digital justice. In fact, there are many discourses and many vocabularies we can use, and some of those resonate with others. I think the exchange also hints at the fact that different vocabularies resonate with different audiences, especially those in the global north and the global south, uh, especially the language of duty and obligation, which often uh, resonates uh, in, in much of uh, Latin America, uh, Africa, and uh, South Asia. Uh, not to create an overly simple dichotomy, but uh, often to the Anglo-American rights tradition, which focuses on individual of rights against the state, against uh, infringement. This idea of a mutual reciprocal relationship can seem a bit foreign, but in fact, um, it's part of the rights tradition uh, going back all the way to the 40s. And I think it can also help us address uh, this idea of, and really the language of vocabulary of duty and responsibility, can help us address some of the limits and uh, the problems we're seeing with rights today. So I, I assume if everyone here is, you know, uh, attending that you're a fan of, of the idea of human rights. Uh, but in some ways we're seeing rights language become overextended um, and used in ways that might not, uh, you know, that might not be uh, the ways that we, that the initial uh, founders of these rights envisioned them. Um, an example, a sort of a controversial example of this is the idea of the emerging right to connectivity, where the very fact of being connected to the internet is often framed as being a right itself, a sort of meta right. Um, now, there, you know, there are debates about this. Some people claim that connectivity is more of an enabler of rights, a facilitator. Uh, but I think that we're missing an overall point, which is that uh, connectivity being framed as a human right represents a sort of this victory for rights language uh, and an eclipse, an eclipse of other sorts of discourses that we could be using. Um, and in fact, what we're seeing not only with the right to connect, but with the so-called right to be forgotten, is a move uh, for instead of rights being, being used in a sort of network of obligation and reciprocity, rights are being used to counter other rights. We spoke in earlier at this conference of balance and the pros and cons of that. Um, but in addition, I think, I think we could go a step further and say that rights are being used as shields and as swords to counter uh, or promote uh, digital, the particular issue of digital justice, depending on our points of view. And so um, my, my plea, my, uh, my seed that I'd like to plant today is just that we consider going forward here in your sessions, in your workshops, as you draft initiatives, as we move forward in drafting new language of rights, that we consider adopting explicit references to duties and obligations of the private sector and of individuals. 
and that this is actually not a, di a diversion or, or really an innovation, but this goes back to the original rights tradition. And it goes back to some of the initial international um, proposals, some of the very first documents that were uh, lead-ups to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights framed human rights just in this way, uh, as obligation. Uh, here's a great example from the American Law Institute, um, their Declaration of Essential Freedom of Rights, which notes that freedom of speech, freedom of expression is the right of everyone. But it doesn't stop there. It has a second clause that says the state has a duty to refrain from arbitrary limitation of this freedom and prevent denial of reasonable access to channels of communication. And so, you know, just here in this little clause, we see what has changed and what hasn't. What hasn't changed particularly much is the first line. Freedom of expression is the right of everyone. But what has changed is our interpretation of obligation, of whether the state is solely responsible for ensuring that or whether states and private actors can collaborate or should collaborate and how those relationships should be defined in terms of service uh, in statements of universal internet right. So as we move um, towards this greater sense of digital constitutionalism, as a recent paper by the Berkman Center uh, coins, coins this idea of defining bills of rights, international norms that are codified and shared for the internet, much in the same way that H.G. Wells was hoping to do. I think we should take a step back and, and remember that the language of duty uh, can provide an alternative, uh, both in terms of uh, audience, both in terms of tone and resonance, uh, but also in terms of clarity and specificity, and that adopting duty's language uh, can help us. Here we have a photo of uh, the drafting committee of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, but that the, the language of duty is actually uh, part and parcel of the human rights movement, and that we as people who care about the, the international digital human rights regime should begin to, to think about adopting that language to promote digital justice everywhere. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Danae from Derechos Digitales. And in this session, I'm going to talk very, very briefly about digital intersectionality. Well, intersectionality is a concept that has been popularized by black feminism. Uh, our reference is definitely her. She is Patricia Hill Collins. And in her book, uh, Black Feminist Thought, he exposed how different is the subject of feminism for different women depending how many types of oppressions overlap in their identities. For example, it's not possible to analyze every woman under only one big, la big lens of gender. Factors as class, nationality, and race should be taken into account. This was a huge advancement in the study of discriminations and as people who work in technology and in human rights, uh, it's a concept that we should address. For example, with FTAs as TPP, most stakeholders intend to talk about general rules about copyright for everyone without considering the huge privilege of the North, of a North that has profited for centuries of the rest of the world culture for free. And now in the South, we are supposed to sit with them and talk horizontally about exceptions and liability. And no, we want the abolition of copyright for our people. We want to overcome the privileges of the North. Or the case uh, when we're talking about women and technology. It's very common to hear about first world priorities as the struggle of female corporate tech CEOs or female tech entrepreneurs. This is a subject clearly fundamental here in San Francisco, for example, but it's not relevant to us since our Latin American patriarchal societies, we have to worry about other stuff like the women that 
every day get killed and harassed and everything without the help of digital resources. And in a, con in a context like this, we're not able, we're not available to talk about apps or the, all this Silicon Valley jargon. You are not, this, this is a priority. Well, this is a big issue, I believe, and we have to think about ways of solving this. Let me talk to you about some examples that we have done in Latin America regarding intersectionality, technology, and discrimination. Uh, this uh, picture is of a protest in Santiago de Chile, and they are the girls from Linea Aborto Libre, is a, or abortion hotline, where you can call and get information on how to perform an abortion. Because in Chile, abortion is penalized under any circumstances. Even if your life is at risk because of the pregnancy, even if the fetus is dead inside you, even if you have been raped, 12-year-old girls are forced to become mothers and women who interrupt their pregnancies go to jail and are publicly harassed and judged. Uh, this is one of the biggest issues for us Chilean feminists and as activists in technology is something that we cannot ignore. Uh, after considering very seriously this extremely complicated context, we work together and we activists have been able to teach on the use of secure communication channels for feminist organizations who provide information on how to perform safe abortions. Now more and more women are using encryption for the protection of their identities and avoid jail. Or let me tell you about surveillance in Chile. This is a picture that actually a colleague from me in the Derechos Digitales took. Uh, we cannot talk about surveillance without incorporating the case of the Mapuche people in the south. They are our largest uh, native community and they are constantly harassed by the um, police and surveilled by drones who, which are bought by military bodies. They are even subject to a special legislation uh, where the rights are constantly ignored because our government considers that they are terrorists for trying to recover their lands from the hands of corporations. In a case like this, we can't, we can't just talk about security policy in some panels formed by privileged lawyers. This is an urgency, and in Chile, we activists have provided information on digital self-defense against surveillance and against police. Analyze what kind of drone is in their land. How can you avoid those without compromising your identity? Without this approach, any effort as discussion about surveillance in conferences like this is going to be not relevant. Should we ban white people from this discussion? That, that is kind of the question that emerges. We wish, no, 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 but we, we know we shouldn't. We know we shouldn't. We want to involve everyone in the quest of a more egalitarian society. But before doing anything, uh, every person should check their own privileges. It's an exercise that all of us must do before trying to approach any social issue. Uh, for example, I hate when women from the first world only with superficial knowledge of our circumstances go to Latin America and tell me what we feminists should do. And because I hate them so much, I have to consider my own privilege in order to not be like this annoying people from the north. I'm not in the peak of the pyramid of privilege. I am a woman, I'm from Latin America, I'm coming from a low class sector of society, but I have to put myself in the place of even less privileged women than me. What about trans women? What about disabled women? I, I want to finish this talk saying that I envision a digital environment where everyone is seriously taken into account. It's a matter of respect, it's a matter of solidarity. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Nathaniel Manning, I'm the COO at Ushahidi. Uh, to start, I want you all to just say the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay, Let, let's try this one more time, but this time just say, 
uh, pay attention. All right, together. All right, so we can be a little louder when we're in unison, when we have focus. So keep that in mind. Ushahidi's goal is to help people raise their voice. Marginalized people don't have a voice. And usually those who serve them, the organizations, the governments, the small community groups, despite their best intentions often, or sometimes not best intentions, uh, have trouble listening. And this is just a, a fundamental issue. How do we understand what's happening on the ground and the needs of the people we serve? So that's fundamentally what Ushahidi does. In 2008, Ushahidi was formed uh, in the post-election violence in Kenya. At that time, uh, the country broke into civil war, uh, more or less, and, uh, and the founders were four bloggers who talked about technology in Africa, wanted to know what was happening on the ground. Some of them were in Kenya at the time, some of them were in the United States, uh, and did, uh, texting everyone they knew on the ground, right, as one would do if your home basically breaks into war. Uh, they start reading every blog they can find. They read through every Twitter uh, hashtag they can find, everyone they know. And they're just trying to figure out this question, what's happening on the ground? And they started asking that question. And they said, OK, well, is there a way I could build something that would do everything that I'm doing manually, which is taking a lot of time, um, and, and make it a little easier? And so they built Ushahidi in the first three days. Uh, Ushahidi means testimony or witness in Swahili. Didn't think anyone outside of Kenya would ever have to go to that URL uh, again. Uh, but luckily, uh, over the last eight years, that hasn't been the case. So in the last eight years, there's been over 100,000 deployments of Ushahidi across 160 countries, and localized into 49 different local languages gathering over 7 million reports. And that's actually just in the cloud version of the software. Open source, because the software is open source, um, it's on its own server. So we don't actually know how many reports are being gathered, right? That's the benefit and the pros and cons of, of open source. Uh, so uh, it's been a really powerful story. Uh, about two years ago, we started rebuilding the core software, about two and a half years ago. Uh, trying to learn and build a new version of Ushahidi because the original code base was written in 2009. It had gotten a little old. Uh, and it was starting to be held together by duct tape and uh, popsicle sticks. And so we, we built a new version, a new architecture. Uh, and to do that, we had to understand really, you know, the first time we built it, we had a very simple use case. And we had four initial users, right, the four founders. Um, now we had 100,000 deployers, 7 million reporters. Uh, that gets pretty hard. That's a totally different problem to solve. Um, so we looked first, OK, who are the main people using Ushahidi? Well, there was three core groups, if we think about it like industry, human rights reporting. So Syria Tracker, Doc Crowd Map, six years of reporting of firsthand witnessed reports of, of violence in Syria. I think there's now 8,000, 8, maybe even over 10,000 reports on that website. One of the most powerful first-hand archives of uh, one of the greatest travesties of this, this century. Um, and uh, the second was human rights reporting. Uh, so harass map, the, the mapping of uh, and the crowdsourcing of, uh, of anonymous witness testimonies of women who are being harassed in Egypt, now actually across uh, North Africa. And what I love was this was just a group of citizens doing this using our open source software, putting it on a website, and now they are a t over 20 person organization uh, working on advocacy for women's rights in, in North Africa and the Middle East. And, uh, and then the third, you know, citizen and government. I kind of call this transparency. This is election monitoring. This is corruption mapping. Uh, this sort of piece. So citizens trying to bring attention uh, to, to their needs, as well as uh, bad actors. So these are kind of the three big groups. But then by the type, there were kind of two different ways people were using our crowdsourcing tool. The first 
was response. So this is, uh, let's say, election monitoring or crisis response. If you've heard of Ushahidi, this might be one of the ways that you've heard of it. The Haiti reports, the Japan most recently um, earthquake, uh, the most recently the, the Nepal earthquake. And in this case, you're trying to gather information from, from someone, let's say, uh, who's saying, help, I'm stuck. And you want to help them. You want to help that one, that one person. You want to respond to that report. You want to allocate your resources more effectively. Uh, the second is transparency or sort of advocacy. And this is different. This is you want to gather as many voices as possible um, and, uh, and, and then try to build a body of knowledge and say, this is a problem, right? In, in Egypt, in the harass map, there it would be really, it's, it's, it's problematic um, to, to try to be responding to each one of those harassment cases. That's uh, as a small civil organization. But by gathering everyone's voices and having thousands of examples, they can start to say, this is a problem, and try to direct uh, policy and attention and inter the international community to do something about it. So as we, we learned, we, we looked at kind of the way and thought about the way that kind of this term crowdsourcing or just data is influencing the transparency and response to humanitarian uh, space. And we think about it kind of like a data supply chain. Um, this, is, this is, I think, the best way. You have gathering of information. So that's kind of where, where I think Ushahidi as a tool excels. We help people gather information from all sorts of different ways. Uh, and then you analyze it, you compress it, you think about the, uh, you filter it, you try to gain insight, and then you do something, you respond perhaps uh, to that, uh, and, and then you, you, or you might visualize it, you might try to analyze trends and get into predictive components. Uh, so that's, that was sort of the tr chain we were seeing and the way that we think about our tool. Uh, and fundamentally it's trying to answer this question of what happened, when and where. You know, what's happening on the ground? That's the problem that we're building tools to help people solve. And, uh, and so to dive a little deeper, right, what happens is anyone sends in information, it gets processed. You can then not only crowdsource the information that's coming in, but you can also crowdsource the filtering and understanding of that information. So everyone in this room sitting at their, you know, I was called armchair volunteers, sitting all over the world, uh, could begin to log into your instance, or whether it's your entire, uh, perhaps it's your entire staff, and this table could be working on translation, and this table could be working on just checking location, and that table could be doing first step verification, second step verification, right, before it goes, to, to, goes out. Uh, and then you have your analysts over here. Uh, then, uh, so the tool allows you to manage that workflow. Basically, that's the big, one of the big things that we built up in the, the next version of Ushahidi. First was complex forms, second was managing workflow. And so, kind of one of the most important things, I think, when you're, when you're crowdsourcing information, go to where the people are. Don't build your own app, you know? That's like really annoying. People have to go download your app. That's obnoxious, I hate downloading apps. I don't know about you. Uh, so, we build in the ability to gather t information via text message, uh, via email, web form. This was sort of the original nuance to Bushahidi. Go to where the people are. Allow you to gather a bunch of direct crowdsourced information as well as try to gain a little bit of signal through the noise. So solving the problem of reading the entire internet is pretty difficult. There are for-profit companies out there that do it. I think it's quite challenging in the nonprofit space. Um, but, but you can still try to gain specific insight by looking through RSS, RSS feeds, hashtags, specific APIs that we then allow you to filter through like if this then that type statements. So if uh, this hashtag has a specific word on it, uh, you know, help, and it comes from this specific location during this time, then put it into this bucket of immediate response. And then, you can, like I said, you can filter, you can verify amongst your group. And then the outputs is, you know, one is a map, which looks really great on slides, but it's also, you know, you can send alerts. You can get a text message. Hey, I want to know if there's been an instance of uh, harassment, rape, or violence in my neighborhood. Send me a text message. Geofence that. Um, send me, uh, you can visualize it. You can begin to look at trends. And then you can export the data and put it into 
other great tools for analysis that are out there. Uh, so a couple of examples of the new version. Uh, I like this one. This is the Guyana election. It's called Vote Like a Boss. Who remembers like vote or die? What that vote like Puck P. Diddy. This is like way better. Uh, vote like a boss. Um, so this is an election monitoring campaign in, uh, uh, in, in, in Guyana um, that is currently operating. Uh, you can see the map there. You can see uh, it's not uh, a little bit of the report section. Um, another example, so it, uh, you can go in and, and you could start your own Ushahidi instance in a matter of seconds today by, by heading to Ushahidi. Um, you know, conceptually, right, Ushahidi is... Is, is a software. We're not a place to come and be like, I want to find, it, it's WordPress, it's not Twitter. You know, head there, build your own tool. Don't head there and say, I want to find that one report, right? That's, that's a little more challenging. If you want to find that one blog post, it's much harder to go to WordPress or Squarespace. We're building tools for you to do great work. Uh, one of my favorite sayings of Ushahidi is, we are not 007, we are Q. Uh, the, the folks probably in this audience, they're, they're the ones out there doing all the great work on the ground, do, being journalists, being, working on transparency. We're just trying to make your job easier. Uh, so you are not the, alone. We, there are some great organizations, big and small, using the tool. Uh, one of my, you know, a couple of my favorites, uh, QuakeMap was a, a crisis response uh, tool in, used in the response to the Nepal earthquake. Uh, it was a, a great deployment. Um, the basically communications channels of the, the, the government fell apart. They didn't really have it well worked. The Nepal Army basically said, go to quakemap.org and report if you need help. Um, so the small group called uh, Kathmandu Living Labs, a local organization who had technical capability, had put this website up, was gathering information, and then sending it out to the Nepal Army for a response. That was their, their situation room. Uh, and, uh, and it worked. Um, so one example I love is, you know, you know help um, uh, medical assistance needed in Sukhani and Sundrapi in Dolkata. Um, what, 12 hours later, the wounded were airlifted by the Nepal Army. You know, that's like a direct impact of someone's being rescued, and that, I just love, love it when we find those, those nuggets. Um, so this is a great example of, of someone using Ushahidi. And then one of my favorites that I actually, again, this is the, the pros and, wonder, and cons of wonderful open source software, um, was that I actually found out recently that the UN Department of Field Services, the peacekeeping missions, the largest standing army in the world, the sanctioned international peacekeeping forces of our world, their incident reporting tool and situational awareness tool platform is Ushahidi and has been for years, and we actually didn't even really know that. Um, so uh, it's probably the largest impact that we make that we didn't know about. Um, so again, pros and cons of open source, but it's, it's awesome because they've been using it and they use it across eight of their uh, countries they work in, some of the hardest places you can work, Mali, um, Somalia, uh, DRC, so it's, uh, it's pretty powerful, and, and they're using that internally uh, for their own staff to be reporting on what's happening on the ground. Again, trying to figure out what's happening on the ground. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the story of Ushahidi over the last few years. Again, we launched that new version of the platform in October. Uh, we highly encourage you to go check it out. Uh, there is, uh, there's even, there's going to be constant updates this year of, of new and great stuff coming out, so keep your eye on it. Like, like any product, new feature releases all the time, new front end. We've been just doing constant UX studies. So if anyone wants to help and loves testing product and giving feedback to nonprofit uh, technology companies making open source software, uh, come talk to me. We'll put you on the list. We love getting that, that sort of help. Uh, that's, how we, that's how we keep going. Um, and uh, you know, I think just the other, the last kind of piece is we do a lot of stuff. I've talked about the platform. It's our biggest piece of work. But, uh, but as a bunch of technologists uh, working in, uh, and came out of Kenya, you know, one of the things that I, I always think is, is kind of powerful about, about our story is not just the power of our users and the power of our platform, uh, but for me, it's the fact that uh, I am frankly a white American male working in Silicon Valley in San Francisco working for a Kenyan technology company. And that really couldn't have happened five years ago. Uh, I think that's pretty awesome um, that 
that that's the case. I'm not like I didn't like I don't I don't go to Kenya to like work on a local pro program and think that I know what's up. Um, that's uh, it's different. There, this is a Kenyan organization, uh, a nonprofit that has reached the entire world, and that sometimes uh, can be shocking for folks. But it's it's pretty powerful for us. So we've done a lot of stuff uh, over the last eight or nine years that works on everything from. Uh, technology and the in the space that we're talking about to uh, just trying to build the ecosystem of uh, uh, in, in in East Africa as well so uh, thank you very much and uh, really appreciate it uh, great cheers